those who don't know, and France is in Europe, for so those who don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe there is American in the room, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the funny story is that um, it's a story of our students um, who did a project called BLC. And the reason why they created the project is that it's a campus from a public university in France. So the campus was owned by a, a, basically a non-profit, but a private entity, right? Uh, this is extremely unusual in France because the top universities uh, and this one, which is an engineering school, are always completely public. Um, and the reason is that uh, it was in a piece of land in a place that was quite nice but quite expensive to buy. So the alumni of the university bought it, um, and they gave it the, the right to use to the, the to the university. Which brings us to um, 1980s. Uh, so that was in built in the 1960s. In the 1980s, they wired that <laughs> with um, something called. Um, uh, Tokenry. Does, does it ring a bell to anyone? Anyone knows what tokenry is? Okay, who's the oldest guy? Okay, 25? <laughs> yeah, 30? Okay. Um, so tokenry is a technology from IBM from the 1980s, which is basically a ring, right? So when you want to talk, when you want to talk, you basically open the ring and you put yourself, so all the packets go through you, and you have a token that is going and you take the token, you put your data, and you wait it out. It works fine when you have five to ten computers, but as soon as you, it's, get, it's getting better, bigger, what happens is you, need, you have higher latency, right? So in the 1980s, it doesn't matter, right? The only thing you're doing is doing some mail and news group on console, so it doesn't matter for the latency. But what happens is that in the 1990s, started the, some video games called Doom, and the problem with Doom is, like for like every uh, FPS, if you start having lots of lag, what happens? Well, you die, right? Because you have shitty ping, and so people kill you. Um, and if you have a token ring with 100 students on it, it's horrible. Like, you have latency of 200, 300 milliseconds, and uh, you're never going to beat a South Korean with that. Um, <laughs> So the students went away and asked for a new network, which was, of course, Ethernet-based. And this, the, the university said, ah, we would like so much to help you, but we cannot because you, the campus is a private entity and we cannot pay for that. Um, so the, the, the students were in the, all, this part of the campus, and of course was uh, private, couldn't have a new network. We were talking about like a few hundred of thousands of uh, dollars or euros, um, so that was too expensive. So they went away and they went to see a few people, and especially the people who built um, the, the campus and a company called Wii, uh, which also had like a TV station. And they went there and said, well, blah, 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 we need a new network, can you sponsor us, blah, 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 blah. You know the kind of stuff when you're students and you want money from big companies. And one guy from the building company says, well, we don't care at all about what you're doing, uh, but if you do a new network, um, then the guy from the TV station are interested. And then if you can put only one satellite dish for the whole campus, and then you stream the video directly on the network, we pay you the network. Of course, today it's obvious, but I'm, I'm talking in 1994, right? In 1994, you got four machines that are 486TX33 megahertz, um, which have four megabytes to eight megabytes of RAM. Right? Not gigabytes. Uh, so those, like, it was completely almost science fiction to be able to actually decode that. So usually you had like big satellite dishes that costed around one thousand dollars, and like decoders, which were like those big box, uh, specialized um, electronic hardware for MPEG to decoding, uh, SD of course, and that costed like five thousand dollars at the time. So for a campus where there is one thousand five hundred students, the cost would be huge. Um, so the students say, well, okay, let's do that. So they, they started the project and, and basically it took them two years to complete. In two years, they managed to have a server that took the packets from the satellite, restreamed that on Ethernet, um, and they find the money and so on, and they had this new network. The network, the project was called, was called Network 2000, because they had like, wow. Yeah, 2000 is going to be amazing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so it works fine. The, 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 they managed to do a demo on a huge machine with 64 megabytes of RAM. 
Um, and of course, everything crashes after 45 seconds, which is fine because the demo is 32 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everything crashes, but it works, and we show that it's possible. So in 1998, some people start to get the project saying, well, maybe there are other campus, maybe there are other universities, other lands that actually care of having streaming of, of like digital video. We're still 10 years before YouTube, right? Um, and they want to do it in an open source way, uh, cross platform and network oriented. And they do that, um, and they call the project Video Plan, because it's video on a local network. Amazing names as usual. Of course, we are coders, right? We don't do marketing. Um, it takes them three years to ma actually manage to be licensed to an open source license, because the university wanted to sell the project for whatever reason. Uh, but finally, <laughs> the project starts and so video land, the project, is a project that has a lot of software. And one of them is VLC, and VLC at the moment was a client software, which was video land client, which VLC comes from. But there were so many other stuff. VLS, which was a server, a lot of libraries, X264, for example, which is the encoder that everyone uses online. X265, uh, some stuff to break DVDs, um, um, multiple uh, libraries, um, servers, uh, designers, and so on. Um, so, VideoLand is a nonprofit that now uh, hosts a lot of those projects, and of course, the main one is VRC. So, it's quite interesting to see that the, the idea uh, this is a, uh, a slide from 2001, it hasn't changed a bit because it's, it's still the same, right? You got either a VLC or a VLS or any other VOD servers taking any input, transcode it, and stream it on a multicast network, right? And then you got clients, which can be VLC, but who can be anything else. Okay. So let's talk about multimedia bits. So working in multimedia is awesome, but not always. Um, so there are two main rules in multimedia. The first one, if, if there is something, if there is a stupid way to do something, someone will do it badly and complain until it's turned out and supported. This is what happens on absolutely every multimedia standard that you're seeing. And also, because in multimedia, everyone thinks he understands everything and basically no one does. Um, even now, when I go to YouTube, I'm actually teaching some stuff about video to the YouTube engineers. Like, what the fuck? Uh, the reason is that <laughs> the reason is that there is so much stuff to know that even if after ten to fifteen years there is so much yet to know. There is like I I learned about a new standard like two days ago that was supposedly done in nineteen nineties and I should know about that. Um, <clears throat> so with those two rules, everything is broken, right? There is a very strong multi-inventive syndrome. To do anything, you have forty-two ways to do it, um, and all the standards are very bad. For example, containers, which is what you usually call demuxes, MP4, MKV, AVI, or, all of them are complete crap. Um, and some of them like, are just completely broken. But like, and except MP4 and MKV, all of them are bad, like horrible. AVI is the worst format ever. FLV, the stuff that you've been using on YouTube forever, is the worst thing ever. All the stuff done by the open source guys is a nightmare. And there is so many codecs we're talking about in VLC, about around 1,000 1, codecs. Um, lots of them are bad designs, lots of them are too complex, and so many of them are badly implemented because of a rule that we told before. Everyone knows, right? And then what happens is that um, you arrive, oh, you find a new script online, you run virtual dub, which is, of course, a software done by a few guys and a few script. It's, of course, completely broken. Uh, and then you, you go and you got people from China who take that. They can't understand anything, so they put X264 in FLV and, and stuff like that. So it, it makes it a huge mess. But that's great, because that's why it's funny, right? Uh, <laughs> because, like, you're an engineer, and you're supposed to do stuff that are, make no sense. You're right in a big mess and you try to make it clean. Um, and this is why VLC is popular, is because VLC works with everything. Like there is even jokes like you could take VHS, you know, the pizza, and put it inside your DVD drive and VLC would play it. Um, don't do that. <laughs> but actually, um, 
<laughs> it's also very interesting because it's a, it's a field that is changing all the time and there is so much stuff to do. Um, yeah. So, VLC or the code. Um, a lot of people um, don't know about VLC, they know about the code player. Right? I think it's around 25% of the traffic that goes, comes to our web page is people who go on, on Google and say code player <laughs> or code videos, which is great, right? It, because like it's completely stupid and insane to use a, a, a code, a traffic code, to, to, for a, a software that plays video. There is absolutely no reason. <laughs> what? A code video makes no sense, right? But it's because it makes no sense that is amazing. Because like so many people know that oh to play a video I need a code, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so distinctive that it's great, right? Um, and the code that plays everything plays actually everything, like weird format from XVid to Flag, Dolby, and so on. You were you bit a bit almost all of you too young, but at some point you had to install software, and then you had to install codec packs. Remember codec packs? Yes. Yeah, okay. And it was a mess because none of them actually worked, uh, especially in the 2001 and 2002. So after you install another connect pack because you need something else, and the new connect pack fights the old, 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 the old connect packs, and then you have no video at all anywhere. Uh, so VLC was the first one who actually decided to not use connect packs and directly come with all the software and all the connects inside. Um, which brings a good thing is that we create the connects. We check that it works with all the combination because, as we said, there is so many codecs, so many formats, so many like. If you have like an MKV with this audio and this video and this kind of subtitles, it's not going to depend. VLC will play it everywhere and all platform, and will not depend on some codec packs that you install, which is very bad for the users. It's also popular because it work, runs everywhere. Um, the last version, of course, Windows, Linux, Mac, but the last version still run on OS two. Anyone knows OS2? Heard of OS2? Yes. Yeah, okay. So there is maybe five people who are still using OS2 in the world. Uh, <laughs> one of them is actually coding on VLC, so that makes four. Um, but um, VLC is designed in an extremely good way, so it's very easy to port to different platforms, which is why we are on Solaris, on PSDs, on Windows, phones, on iOS, on Android, on Android TV. I don't think there is many other open source software that run on so many platforms. Um, and one of the reasons is because it was correctly engineered by people before me, people who were actually clever. Um, so we talk, we are speaking about one million downloads per day on our website. Uh, and as it's open source, of course, it's outside of Linux distribution. It's outside of people who go to download.com and download VLC with a lot of ads um, and, and so on. But this one is a bit outdated. We probably have between 300 and 500 million users which makes it quite large, um, and it's probably one of the largest in the top 20 uh, down, um, software in the world, but actually done by a community, people on their free time, and started by students who are no, no younger than you are. VLC plays so many things, DVDs, Blu-rays, CDs, network stream, but also external hardware, webcams, uh, DVB, satellite, um, TV, and so on. So, I'm going to show you a few stuff. Um, so this is one of the oldest screenshot of VLC. If you look closely, you, or if you have good eyes, there is still written VLAN client. Um, so that was before the server side was merged. Who can tell me what movie is that? Come on. No? Yes, which one? Any idea? Yes, it's a James Bond, Pierce Brosnan. No? No. He doesn't have this car in Golden Knight. Okay, you'll tell me at the end of the talk, right? <laughs> um, the first version of on, on, on GTK and GNOME 2 are very old versions written in directly in GTK. One of the first versions where we could actually stream and um, read direct live stream from Roland Garros. Um, tennis, the first version of Mac is this very horrible glossy UI that used to be on Mac OS. Um, this is probably the version that people started using VLC with, the old something written in a toolkit called WX widgets. Uh, if you can, never use that widget. Uh, it's horrible. 
more versions on macOS, which starts to be a bit more recent. And now we move to Qt. And of course, the best version, the last one, which is playing pony, so that's probably the best one. Uh, <laughs> so that's GNOME 3 um, on the Debian, I guess. OK, um, so as I said, it's done. it was done as a student project starting to, from 2001 to maybe even before 1998 until 2006, only by students in a university in the fourth year, so first year of master's degree. Um, and then a community was built around it uh, by people on their free time, young professionals. Um, and yet it, they can do something good. So now uh, I created the, the Vidalan Nonprofit Organization, which is uh, basically federating a lot of other software related to VLC. So here, when you see the, which is our uh, annual conference, like maybe one third are working on VLC, the rest are working on FFmpeg, X264, or other related projects uh, around the Yeah, so what's interesting is that the nonprofit is only um, done with developers, and the members are only developers, uh, and the nonprofit is not employing anyone. So, Everything we do has been done online. Uh, everything we do is using open source software. Um, we use Git since early 2007, so before GitHub. Uh, we use Crack, PHPBB, mostly IRC to communicate. You know IRC, it's like Slack, but for old guys. Um, <laughs> and mainly it's like Telegram, but not for other uh, old guys. Um, but actually it works. It works quite fast. It's very, very efficient. Uh, that's, uh, I was discussing about the fact that I receive around 700 emails per day. It's quite easy to use if you're using actually text, um, text uh, based uh, networking. So maybe some of you heard about the cathedral via the bazaar. Does it ring a bell to someone? Yeah, right? So there are two ways of doing uh, software. One is a cathedral way, which is basically Microsoft with a head and uh, VPs and VPs of engineering and team leads and blah, 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 and then engineers. And when the decisions are done at the top and then they go bottom, right? And you have to do it and you don't. And it's very difficult to get outside of what was planned. Um, even though the plan is often very late, it's very difficult to go outside. <coughs> so the idea of open source is to do exactly the opposite, right? Is to let everyone in a bit of chaotic way, do something, and then you select the best that comes from this bazaar. And you select the best and you merge it. And the idea is that because you're going to do, to allow anyone to actually contribute, you are going to see stuff that you did not plan but are actually useful. Because some of your users are going to become small contributors and communicate in your community to bring ideas. And so that's actually what we call free software. Uh, communities, not the new open source way, which is basically Google putting one million lines of code per year and you can't contribute back. And this is what you have in most of the Linux distribution. This is what you have on GNOME, KDE, you used to have in Firefox before it became a big company, and so on. So VLC is a very small team. The core team of VLC is five to 10 people. Um, the people who work every month on VLC is maybe 15. Uh, so that's very small for a software that is on so many platforms. Uh, since the beginning of VLC, between 600 and 800 people actually contributed to the software, which makes it quite large, and every year around 100 to 150 people actually work on VLC. And what's interesting is that the, we decide whether your functionality or pull request is going to be merged what, but by maintainability, right? Because you're going to come and say, oh, I've got this amazing feature. Here is my code. And I'm just like, no, your code is shit. It says, oh, yeah, but my feature is great. I'm just like, yes, but your code is shit. Um, <laughs> and I said, what's going to happen in six months when you're gone? And said, oh, but I was. I will be not gone. I will stay, right? <laughs> sure, exactly. You won't. Like, statistically, you will not stay because there is five people who stay over 600. What happens is that you're going to go to the army, um, <laughs> you're going to uh, find a girlfriend, find a boyfriend, get married, have a child, have an accident, have anything. I mean, like, it's life, right? You are not going to stay, right? Um, change up. Um, so when you send me code, you need to 
make it clean so I can maintain it, right? Um, and that's why a lot of stuff in VLC, like people say, oh, why don't you have this basic feature? It's so important. And basically, maybe because it's too complex to do, or maybe it doesn't fit the architecture. And I'm not going to put crap on VLC because then it's not going to stay around. You're going to tell me, oh yeah, but I use this software, bot player, VS player, car player, and so on. Sure, how many of them have stayed? No, right? There is a new player coming on each platform. They stay around two years, three years, done by one guy, one smart guy maybe, and then it goes away, right? VLC, we do it the, way, the right way, the correctly engineered way, so it stays in the long term. When I add a codec, I'm going to add it forever. I'm not going to remove it in two years. And also, it's, we have no marketing, no legal. Everything is done by the students and engineers. The people who code are the ones who have the power. If you want to do something, show me what you can do. Don't tell me, oh, I'm going to do that. Show me what you do. I mean, code that is not shipped to your user does not exist. Right? Everyone can write a, a cool hack, but ship your cool hack to 100 million people, then we discuss. Okay? So why is VLC popular, right? There were so many other media players at the time, so many probably were actually better than VLC, right? Um, and there is a few reasons. The first reason is module, the second is C minus minus, and the third one is network oriented. So let's speak about modules. VLC does not exist. Um, I'm very sorry to tell you that VLC doesn't exist. VLC is a very thin wrapper around a software called libvlc, which is basically a multimedia framework. It's a multimedia framework like GStreamer, like DirectShow, or Media Foundation, or QuickTime. It has a very small core, called libvlc core, around 180,000 to 100,000 lines of code in C. Nothing huge. And then you've got modules. And the core can't do anything. Everything is done in different modules. And that makes it quite efficient because most of the modules are 1,000 to 2,000 lines, which means that any one of you could write a VLC module in a week. Right? We're talking 1,000 lines of code C. It's not difficult. Um, but there is a very simple API between libvlc core and the module. So most of the modules are not going to touch and move ever. So when you add a feature, it will stay. And also, when you want to add something, you don't need to patch everything. You just need to do your own stuff. And this is how, for example, VLC is easy to port to a new platform, because on a new platform, you just need a new way to output audio, output video, and do a small UI. You don't need to change the codec, because the codec is basically something, an algorithm that fits on all the platforms. But then you're going to tell me, yeah, but when I use VLC, I'm, I don't care about the modules. Yes, as a user, everything is automatic. So the good thing is that we made it so that you can do modules and they get loaded automatically by magic. Um, and this is why VLC got popular, but it's also why VLC didn't get too much, too much bloated, because everything stays in different modules. So as I said, the score is basically managing memory, networking, thread handling, and loading of the modules, but nothing else. It doesn't know any decoding, it doesn't know what video it is, it doesn't do anything. And VLC is maybe 800,000 lines of code, so 100,000 in the core, and then 700,000 in modules. But most of the code is outside, external libraries. Other open source projects that we use, FFmpeg, Libaby, uh, Libog, and so on, so every format. So most of the modules are actually loading a different library done by other people, and we integrate that correctly in a good way and test it. So when you ship VLC, it's probably now more around 10 million lines of code, 50% uh, is C, and 40% is C++, and the rest 10% is weird stuff. Um, <laughs> maybe a lot of XML, maybe a bit of Rust. So, and the second reason VLC is very simple to code for is because we kept to C. Wow, C, that's the old thing from the 70s. Yes, but that means it runs everywhere in a correct way. Um, doing C++ is amazing, especially if you want to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, <laughs> Because there is no one in the world that understands C++, right? 
Even the guy who wrote C++ can consider that he understands 80% of it. So the problem is that everyone has its own feature set of what they like in C++, and never, not everyone agrees. So when you have in, in, in a collaborative way, you need to have a very small subset, and the small subset is basically C. Uh, but then you say, well, it's too limited. And especially if you want to do abstraction, so you have modules that get loaded automatically, it's difficult to do that in C. So we use what we I call C minus minus, which is a kind of abstraction around up, uh, C, which is basically abusing function pointers and basically what we call common members, which are basically like the, a way to have like a, a core, a core sh shared of uh, variables, and then each module extend it, and the and it writes callbacks that the core is going to be able to call. So it's a very, very simple objective um, object uh, programming, but it works very well. And also, when VLC was starting, C++ was very, very slow to compile, and not all the the, the platform had a C++ compiler. Then, and any other language that is not C or C++ or Objective C is too slow, right? We are talking about multimedia. We are talking about real time. I got 60 milliseconds to render a frame. I don't have 60 milliseconds and a half, right? So everything needs to be written in C or C++. And a lot of assembly written by hand because you want to have the best of your processes. So yes, in 2018, there are still people who write assembly by hand. And that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you decode in the video in VLC? Here you got a protocol. Protocol is basically uh, your I/O, right? HTTP, but it could be file, it could be DVD. So basically, you have a URL here, and it gives you a stream of data here, right? And then you have your format, which is basically AVI and KV and before. It splits the data into video, audio, subtitled, metadata, and then you got, and then here it's going to be an audio codec that is going to take the compressed data, decompress it. Filter it and output it. Here is your ear. And same here, video codecs, video filter, and your eyes. Okay? And all that is done automatically. Right? Based on the URL, we can get the stream. Based on the beginning of the stream, you can guess the format. And then you split them. And when you split them, you got enough information to decide which codec it is. And everything is done automatically. Okay, do you see anything weird on this diagram? No? Yeah, the master stream. Yeah, what do you say? The elements are. Yes, thank you. Um, so here is my thing is that if instead of Displaying, you want to restream it for whatever reason. So you can re-encode, you can transcode files, you can change the format, and so on. VLC can do that because it's a material framework. The remark from there is that, oh, but you two arrows here are in the wrong way. That's what you said, right? Yes, this is correct, because what's happening in VLC, I can tell you from YouTube and so on, is VLC is very um, efficient. When you go on YouTube, and you see how much it downloads. It basically starts and goes as fast as possible. There is a burst of data at the beginning, and then it, it, it reads. Even if you don't watch the video, right? It's completely inefficient, and it, you can have downloaded 100 megabytes of video without needing. In VLC, it's only in the other way. So basically, the format, which is MJV or MP4, know where you are in the playback. And it's just going to buffer one second for 30 mil 300 milliseconds for file, one second for HTTP. And just going to have, add to have callback and access to the IO layer. Oh, I need more data. Okay, um, and that means that VLC is never going to consume more data than it's actually going to read. And this is a very, very um, rare thing that you have. But it's based on the fact that at the beginning VLC was done as a network client, and and a network client for real time, you can't ask for more data because there is no more data because it's fine. So why is it good that VLC was a network player? Well, VLC is one of the only players that can play broken streams. Um, yes. For example, it never happened 
that you were on a very slow connection before fiber, and you were downloading stuff on BitTorrent, Emule, Bidonkey, uh, DC++, and so on, because of course you're all low uh, abiding citizen, and no one of you ever downloaded anything. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go back when you were at 56k to download a 700 megabyte DivX, it was taking you 24 hours, right? And for 24 hours, you were downloading, and because you needed all the data to, uh, for, to play it on Windows Media Player, even with all your connect packs, you couldn't know what was in. So if you were downloading your, your a James Bond movie, and it was a Disney movie, well, you couldn't know until you have downloaded everything. Same for whatever else you were downloading, right? Because there is so many fake on, on those PSP networks. In VLC, because it's a network player, if it cannot find the metadata at the end, it says, well, I can't read it, but I'm still going to do. Because on network, you lose packets. Because on a network, you can't go at the end, because there is no at the end. And this is why VLC was one of the first players to be able to play unfinished download streams and incomplete streams because of this networking idea they had at the moment. So now I'm going to show you a lot of features that are completely useless, but that you have in VLC. You have a remote desktop in VLC. So this is a virtual machine with Mac OS, this is a VLC, and you have VNC and a remote desktop directly built in VLC. But actually, you can actually click because you really have modules that can get clicks in VLC. Is it useless? Yes. <laughs> you can do screencasting on VLC, so you can record your, your lab. Your, your, of course, there are software that can do that way better, like OBS. But it's really cool because you can do some nice movies on IBM and get a lot of karma when you post that on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, VLC is not a player. VLC is a multimedia framework. It can read lots of streams at the same time. So this is a way to do Mosaic, where basically it's one VLC who actually decodes 25 or 20 streams in parallel recomposes it as a mosaic, and then streams that out. You can do wall displays, a lot of big displays that you see outside of basically VLC at the, at, the, at the core, but you can do that in one machine, but you can do that also on multiple machines. Each machine is decoding or displaying only part of it, and everything is uh, synchronized uh, on the network by the timestamps of the video. We support karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Probably some Asian guy loving karaoke did that. I don't know. We support MIDI, of course, because we are from the 1990s. Of course, we have supports of um, that you, we have UI. There are no UI that you can control from command line. Uh, but the video is still. Ah, a complete video, which doesn't work when you're SSHing on a server, so that's why you have also the full, um, the full uh, ASCII art output. <laughs> I want to say that this is ASCII, right? This is not Unicode. So it's only using the 128 bytes of ASCII. <laughs> why? Yeah, because. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have a web interface that you can either control your VLC, that's how most of the VLC remotes work, or you can restream that in HTML5. Um, let me see Okay. Yes. Okay. Stupid video. Whatever. We have video fixes that are completely useless. And one of them is, for example, the puzzle game. <laughs> 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 yes, someone actually coded that. Right? <laughs> and of course, I suck at this game. 
Uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. <laughs> why? Uh, <laughs> I have a difficult time to explain why. <laughs> but actually it works, right? Um, and if you find it um, too easy to do, um, you can of course uh, decide that you need more rows or more colors. <laughs> and you can see it. Okay? Um, the, guy, the guy who wrote that is of course a mathematician who was bored. Um, <laughs> <laughs> TVs, Android Autos, and we support Android 2.2 up to Android 8.1. Um, yes, not many people support it 2.2. It started very ugly, and then it became more material, and still works quite fine now. We did the same for iOS, um, which was a bit difficult because of um, licensing issues, but it still works. This was the first version, and it even works on the Watch if ever you wanted to watch a video on your watch. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, versions for Apple TV or Android TV, uh, versions for UWP, Windows Store, and we even port it to Tizen, but that's that I think. Um, so let's talk about what this is three point zero, which was out last month, is about. <laughs> So VLC 2.2 called Model Wax is very strong right now. Um, it was released three years ago, um, and it was uh, one of the major versions of VLC. We had more than 100 million of downloads on our website of the single version, which gives you more or less the idea of, um, of the size of the use of VLC. I, it was quite still. Now we move to Veterinary, which is also a very other dangerous person, don't cross with him. We're talking about uh, 20,000 comics on VLC for that version. It was very long, took uh, three years. But it's a very strong release, and it's basically a focus on having the same code base on mobile and on desktop. It has hardware decoding everywhere, so you can do 4K or 8K on the last laptop. So I've seen some people who have uh, Surface Books. Uh, you can have 8K, 60 FPS, 10 bits decoding on a machine. Uh, on a phone, if you have a, a S8 or S9 or an Alt 8, you can get also 8K, 60 FPS. Uh, we have now uh, all everything related to 360 video, 3D audio. Um, you can browse networks, so uh, share the, your NAS, your SMB share, your FTP, and so on. Uh, and we support uh, a lot of new formats. And the podcast. So we support we support Windows from XP to 10, uh, Mac OS 10.7 to 10.13, Android 2.2 or 2.3 to 8, and uh, iOS from 7 to 11, and of course all the Linux distribution. So it's very large, especially for a, what is it the LAN or the Linux? <laughs> yeah, we, we don't build for Linux. People build for us. It's impossible to do <laughs> Linux. Um, it's probably one of the largest software that supports so many others. Like if you take LibreOffice or Office or Firefox, they don't support that many platforms, right? All of them have dropped XP and macOS, but none of them are actually doing Android and iOS with the same codes. So, as I said, now we support um, networks, uh, shares, so FTP, SMB, and so on. So you need to store passwords. So now we have a way to store encrypted passwords. Uh, we did a lot of changes to get support for Chromecast, and we did a lot of uh, changes to uh, have uh, new dialogues. But what was important is uh, GPU decoding with no copy. Why no copy? Well, because as we say, Mem copy is murder. 
Um, main copy is murder is uh, what we say all the time in VLDO. Because today, if you start main copying a 4K 60 FPS frame, you kill your machine, even your faster laptop. Because there is so much data to do that your GPU is dying. Um, and this is true, and this is a big problem And in the past. And the only way to solve that is to have hardware accelerated decoders. And those decoders are based on inside your GPU or inside your, your CPU. And in the past, VLC was doing only software decoding. So you wanted to have zero copy to be able to have full hardware decoding and activate that by default. It's very difficult to activate that by default when you have hundreds of millions of different configurations. So many people have broken drivers because not all of them are playing Overwatch. So they don't care if their driver is up to date. But they all want to play the video that comes out from their phone, which are basically now recording in 2K or 4K easily. So we have hardware decoding in all the, on all the platforms for HVC, from Windows XP to uh, iOS. We spend a lot of time uh, to, uh, uh, to support a lot of old formats because we really want VLC to be the one that plays everything. And even if you think it plays everything, there is still lots of formats, especially from the old times, that were not supported. So we spend a lot of time on that. We rewrote our uh, subtitle. Um, so it's, uh, it seems obvious, but it's very difficult because there is no um, rendering of what we call complex text layouts. So that's Malayalam, I believe. Uh, and it's usually you never do that, right? You ask your uh, OS to do it. But we're cross-platform, so I, I don't have an OS to ask for rendering text. So it's actually a guy who was in Syria, in Aleppo, under the war, who, was, who spent like his day saying that he has no job because there is bombing everywhere, and um, who had like two hours of internet per day, who actually started working on that and managed to do that. And I think it's a very interesting story because that shows that if you have got a laptop and internet enough to charge your laptops and batteries, you can actually do good stuff. And I still don't know what's written there. <laughs> but also, you have um, it also supports multiple fonts and multiple languages at the same time. So this is there should be a mix of Korean and uh, Japanese over there. And also, this is like supported uh, in VLC on all platforms. As I said, VR, 360 videos, and here uh, the projection for, for the context. Um, so, 360 video, everything related to uh, displaying on the sphere. Um, it's, it was VR was the thing to be. I'm not sure anymore if it's going to be the thing to be, but um, we support that in VR display. What we do also, which is a bit more less um, less uh, used, is what we call ambisonics. Ambisonics is a way to render uh, audio around you, and when you turn your head with your headphones or your your mobile, it's going to turn the sound field so you can really feel where the sound are coming from. So if you have uh, the last nice version of VLC with the headphones, uh, you have a lot of videos that where you can test, where you actually can hear the sound turning around. It sounds easy, it's not very complex, uh, lots of mathematics, but it's uh, basically technology written in the 1970s, but it was too difficult to compute at that time, and now we can do that on your phone. And so many other stuff in VLC Scredotzi. Uh, this is a bit like more recent version of VLC on Android and Android TV, uh, bring more to the animation and material way. Okay. So, the question is, what are we going to do for the future, which is going to be VLC 4.0, one of the ways to finish the VR, because now we can re see any VR video inside VLC, now you want to see VR inside your headsets, your Oculus or your Vive. So we're going to add that directly in VLC without making a new application because that you need to download it from something else. Uh, it's going to be called Otto Schrick. Um, it's a vampire photograph from this world again. Um, and what we're going to do is to change the architecture of the video input, to change the way to be a bit faster. Um, and we're going to add a media library inside VLC uh, 
so you can manage your music and your TV shows directly inside BLC. So this is, for example, what we have on Android. Maybe we're going to come something closer to that on, on Windows. Or maybe closer to that. We don't know yet. But do a, a UI that is a bit uh, better. And finally, I'm going to have old version of Mac Windows and Mac OS. We're also working on a few stuff. The first thing is that we're working on compiling VLC to JavaScript, so you can run the whole VLC inside the web browser. Um, compiling millions of C and C++ code with threads inside a web browser is a bit tricky, but <laughs> we try. Uh, and also we're working on sandboxing VLC uh, for security reasons. And I think I've talked for too long. So any questions, please ask. I don't need people who can ask. <laughs> Question: How long do you spend? Uh, how do you like justify? You know, uh, maintaining the older platforms like the older Android versions, especially since it's not. You know, I mean, I mean, the time used maintaining those platforms can be used to, I don't know, make new features or whatever, right? Okay. No. If you do that, which is basically you only care about the last version, right? Because yeah. you start saying, ah. Oh, yeah, I need this new API, right? And it's basically laziness because you're only going to target the last API for your Android application. There is often there is no reason actually to do that. But the thing is that the old your users who are on the oldest platform who can't upgrade because their phone can't upgrade, they are stuck with your old bugs. So if you start with this mindset from engineer who are just like, ah, oh, it's too difficult to fix, I'm going to use a new API which is the API, the way that everyone is doing now, basically, you drop your users all the time and you take all the short paths. And you never stop like thinking for five minutes, maybe there is something, a different way to do it and better. And often, the old way is faster. Because the, the people who are developing the new API on Android are people at like Google. They have 64 gigabytes of RAM, they have big Xeon to compile, and they all have Pixel 2 Excel, right? They don't give a shit about you, who, are, who isn't. And, and, and this is, if you're doing software on the server side and you don't distribute it, yeah, sure, do that. But most of the time, I mean, it's what uh, some guy called GWZ, who started Mozilla and Netscape, said is a, uh, um, Attention deficit syndrome for development. Oh yeah, I got you my new my new API. I drop all the old bugs because they are outdated, and you move to the next thing, and you keep doing that all the time. But your software never works. But you don't care because you only care about the last version. This is not how you do a, a solid software. This is how you do maybe a startup, but not a solid software. And if you spend a bit of time just thinking about Hey, maybe I can do it in a better way. Then you got something, some things like the VLC. You know, if I can run it on Linux and Windows and BOS, well, you know, maybe I can run it on Windows XP and Windows Vista, consider that they are just two different platforms. And in VLC, 90% of your code you have on Android is the one that is running on Windows. So it's not that difficult. But it requires you to think about what you're doing and it's often not what you have time because you have a manager who wants to ship, 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 ship your features so that he can get small. Other question? I still don't eat people. <laughs> Only in the morning. So like, even all the features, like, how do you guys manage like, potential code growth? As it's module, it's easy. Because a module, like you see the puzzle filter, it hasn't changed in 10 years. The only thing it's going to do is increase the download size, and now the download size of VLC is 30 megabytes. It's not big. Compared to any, like even if you download a chat application which has just like, like Slack, you download it only already 150 megabytes. 
and it doesn't have like half of the features of PLC has. So, <laughs> no puzzles. And is as a way, PLC is done with modules. We only load modules when you need them. So I got a new a, a known filter. It's not going to show your machine code. Just maybe one of the K that you install, and I'm not even sure that's the biggest problem. So the fact that it's different modules make that the core is very lean, and we have tendency to remove code from the core to keep it simple. How do you decide what the bizarre How do I decide with code what which code gets in? If your code is clean, it gets in. Do you really think that we would have merged the puzzle filter <laughs> if we if the reason was usefulness? So yeah, the main reason is first is your code clean. And is the code you're sending not going to slow down anyone else? Because if for your puzzle filter, you come and change the core and makes all the video a bit slower, it's a no-go directly, right? So it needs to be fast because we are doing real-time video. You can't wait. Yes, yes. And it, you don't even need benchmarking, right? It's easy. You see when the video is dropping very, very fast. Um, when you are plugging from one platform to another, um, what do you do with like uh, uh, external libraries that are not available on the platform? What you are what you thinking about? So uh, I'm thinking about like your modules that that call external modules. Sorry, external libraries. We compile the external libraries also. But if they don't work on those, we don't build, we don't build the module. You you can have ELC versions which have maybe fifty modules. Instead of the usual 400 or 500. So how you how you start on a new platform is basically you start with only one module and the core. You port the core, you compile the core, and then you start compiling a few codec libraries so you can test at least one audio, one video. Then you write a new audio output and a new video output. And once you do that, then you start adding all the other libraries to check so that you can support all the files. But if there is a module that doesn't compile, well, it's not shared. It doesn't matter, right? Because as everything is dynamic and modular, it's not. You need a way to output audio and video. That is sure. But anything else should be easy. Um, regarding the magic USB data, um, like um, what kind of heuristics? How do I figure out? Do that? What is it? Can you read? Can you read more or less? Yeah, yeah. yeah? It's good enough. Blah 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 blah. This is the PNG decoder for VLC, right? You have only two core. One is the open, one is the closing. So the more uh, the core can call it. And you have a one function called decode. So we are going to see. So this is the declaration, which says, well, this is my two callbacks, the open and the closing one. There is also encoding, but we don't care. The opening one is just going to do that, right? The core arrives and says, well, gives an object from the core. You as your decoder, you cast it to decoder because you know that you are decoder. Then you check if the if the format of the code is PNG, and if so, then you go through. If it's not either PNG or MPNG, you return and VLC goes to the next one. And if you look, if you see VLC, every module has a score and a capability. So. 1000 is the highest capability and zero is the lowest. And so when you want a video decoder, you're going to, to try every video decoder you have, maybe 80, 
starting with the one with the highest score to the lowest score. Okay? So that is for a decoder. But here you say, well, there is no magic here because you already know that you want something to read PNGs. So let's go and see which one is easy. Hmm. This is an image DMAP file. Okay, you still have an open function, open, yes, that you declare here. Basically, here I'm going to pick, which is which means I'm going to uh, read directly uh, and do what we call detect. So how do I detect? Here you see, I got a kind of table. Yes, for all the image formats, which are basically checking the marker and the size. And let's look at is BMP. So in BMP, I'm going to read the first 18 bytes of the file. I'm going to first check if it starts by B, M, B, A, C, I, C, P, C, I, C, and so on for the first two bytes. If it doesn't, then it say, well, it's not a BMP, and you go to the next one. And then you're going to check the file say, size, the data offset, the header size. Does it look like a, a, a BMP? If it doesn't, then you return false, and you go on. And then if all of those work, then you say, well, this should be a BMP file. So then you go back to the your detect function here. Here, and you try, well, did the detect work at the beginning? Yes, you try to detect, then if it works, then good, else you try again. And then you, if you need more, you go and you read more in the file and so on. Okay, and that gives you, okay, I have a file which is going to be BMP, and then this debugger is going to say, well, I can read this track of data and add it, and then it goes to the decoder. Okay? This is the kind of magic you have. So I think it's your BIM guy instead of a BIM guy. The only people who use Emacs are the ones who never managed to exit BIM. <laughs> Question over there? At the back? Yes? No? I still don't eat people. Uh, you mentioned you still hand code assembly, right? That yes. Wouldn't that make some parts of the code like less portable? Yes. Which so what well, you you only have a C function, and then depending on the CPU, you accelerate them, but only for them. So you always have a C function, and if you can, you have to fit assembly versions. So what portions of the uh, DLC should like do you think should be written? I would say it's probably 10% of the code. As, um, as a general, like, like what, what portions? Like, decoders. Decoders. Yes, only decoders. Yeah, I noticed actually the UWP version of VLC yes. is using like the native Windows code instead of no. No, no, no. <laughs> No other questions? I'm not coming back to Singapore for the next 10 years, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> now or never. Like, uh, right now, right, how, how common is the code base between your mobile and the... 90%, maybe more. Like, the, the, the UI on Android is maybe... Okay, let's check. Thirty one thousand lines of code for the Android UI. 
right? The Qt interface for Windows is around 30,000 or so, right? Everything else is common. You have an, the audio output for Mac, um, Android is maybe 2,000 lines of code, and the output on video is OpenGL, so it's common with the rest of the OpenGL. Yes, it's common with iOS. So um, a lot, a lot, lot. How do you have Java and Kotlin? How do you write a UI for Android? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some, yeah, some builder, yeah. or some interface builder, stuff like that. Yeah, but how do you write code to it for React? Java? Yes, so <laughs> why do we have Java? Yeah, but why do you also have Kotlin? Because Kotlin is easier to write than Java. Have you ever written Kotlin? So why don't you just write everything in Kotlin? <laughs> <laughs> because VLC was starting five years on Android was starting five years ago, and Kotlin is just starting to actually be useful on Android. And so because you need to call the APIs, and if the APIs are not exposed in Kotlin, you can't do anything. So are, are there plans like <coughs> sort of moving to newer languages? It's, I think you mentioned no. that there's also Rust inside. Yeah, the reason is <laughs> no. Why? Every time there is a new guy who arrives and says, Oh, I'm going to write everything, I tell you, go away. <laughs> because you can never ever rewrite something and not lose features. It is absolutely not possible. Right? So what happens is that new features or very limited function can be moved and improved, but it's very difficult because you're going to lose features. Right? Oops, this is my test. Yeah. <laughs> so it's always like tempting to say, well, the previous guy was stupid and I'm going to be better. Uh, the fact is you're not clev more clever than the guy before. Um, they are geniuses, not many of them. I know maybe two of them. And the rest is just like very smart guys and girls like you are but you're not geniuses. So you're going to do mistakes, and you're, maybe if you don't cannot understand the code of the guy before, is maybe he had a good reason. Maybe not, but maybe he had a good reason. So unless you understand everything that was written before, you cannot rewrite the code. So you can add features or improve feature with a new language, but rewriting for the sake of rewriting, because it's cooler, is the most stupid thing ever done. So never rewrite something unless you know why. I mean, most of the banks are still running COBOL, right? Code was written in the 60s, it still works. No one wants to change that. So, for example, new formats, yeah, we are using, using Rust, because Rust is fast and safe. So if I want to do something with VLC, I need a language that doesn't have garbage collection, so that removes everything, I believe, more than new languages. <laughs> um, so I got C, C++, Rust. I can't use Go. I can't use uh, what's new and trendy. Swift. Yeah, Swift is different because it's only on iOS, right? It's very difficult to make it, but Swift doesn't have a garbage collector because it's a ref concept. So Swift could could work, but it's language for Apple. So the same reason on VLC on iOS, we're using Objective-C and we're moving more and more to Swift. But I'm not going to use Go or TypeScript or whatever JavaScript <laughs> thing. Okay, other question? What do DNSs? <laughs> uh, one is uh, called Samuel Ozva. Um He is the one who wrote the ASCII art video output of VLC. <laughs> and he's the one who moved up VLC to modules. He's a French uh, funny guy, very, 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 very clever. Um, and he's uh, now a video programmer for a, a, a small company and a very funny bad guy. And the other guy is the guy who is actually, that I know, who is Kostya, who is from Ukraine, I believe, and lives in Germany, uh, who reverse engineer codecs, taking TLNs of 
10 to 20 megabytes and understanding things in it, which is possible. <laughs> He's the one who reverse engineered uh, most of the video for Windows formats that you have in VLC, the go to meeting, and, and so on, and he's a fucking genius. <laughs> Else, you know, not many. Lots of very smart guys or girls, no problem. But moving from being a very well educated in a nice institution and being between 120 and 140 of IQ is nothing special, right? So many of them are. It's great, but it doesn't make you a genius. Okay, there was another question, yes. What do you think DLC is not good at? Wow, that's a good question. Um, for a long time, DLC was not good at performance, until 3 Because it was software decoding, and because we didn't have a team to do that correctly. And now, with 3.0, we're faster than MPC on Windows, we're faster than uh, MPV on Linux, we're faster than QuickTime on Mac. So, for a long time, DLC wasn't good at uh, at that, uh, now I would say the playlist and the media library is shit. It's impossible to use. You cannot replace iTunes with VLC because you can't manage your music with VLC. Um, and the UI, the UX is good, the UI is not. So we need to work on that. What do you think is bad in VLC? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I was waiting for 3.0 only for the high DPI. Yeah, high DPI is a mess on Windows. Yeah. Very messy. Yes? Uh, can you show us how you run the SP uh, <laughs> thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can because I believe I broke it. <laughs> because the problem I have is that I have never a VLC working on my machine. <laughs> because, of course, I'm always coding something, right? Uh, <laughs> Oh. Wow, that's not fast. What is true is that? Très bien. What else? Is there any other distribution than Debian? <laughs> <laughs> LFS? Yeah, that's not distribution. <laughs> I did that a long time ago. Wow, your connection speed is not moving. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think for because they are using the guest is on the mirror. Yeah. Oh, because it's a French. Yeah, it's a French. I don't know if it's so <laughs> yes, why I yeah. <laughs> 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 Do I have something to show? Yeah, it's not easy for that one. 
Anyway, okay. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> And? Sorry? Still have enough to get back. Oh, I got my company now. I got the startups based on what I'm doing. I just created uh, my company five years ago. We're now 18, doing consulting and video and stuff. So that's how I. Do. And how much time did you spend for a book? You don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Lots, lots, lots. So all the all the developers are volunteers, basically. Ah, huh? uh, all all the developers of DLC are volunteers. In two thousand thirteen, yes. Now a lot of them now are working for because it's we want to go faster and have more support and be as good as the others. I need people to work full time. So maybe now half are working on it. <coughs> how do you get the sponsors or like how do you their funding twice? I sell services to companies. <laughs> like people who want to have video inside their apps for mobile or so on. Many of the apps that you have on your phone that are playing video are actually using the VLC engine. And for that to work, they need consulting, so they pay me. Okay? Yeah? Why are you in Singapore? Huh? Why are you in Singapore? <laughs> I'm in Singapore because there is a conference called Fosesia at the Lifelong <laughs> Learning Something Institute. <laughs> Somewhere very far from here, the other part of the town, yes. And I'm going to be giving a conference on Sunday. She's going to be close to the So that's why I'm in Singapore. Three days. Yeah. Which is why I emailed him. Oh. Yeah, I saw that he's, he might be in town, so he might be able to drop by. Yeah. Are most of you developers still French from this one university? No, but at least in a core team, two out of five are. Oh, yes. So that's, uh, that's pretty. Cool, and in the company, about three guys who are coming from this university. Uh, but most of the people who are developing the FCR are either from, from France or Germany, a lot of Germans. Uh, so it's a really fun tool. Almost no Americans, almost <laughs> <laughs> no Americans because there is too much patents in software in the US. So working on multimedia is very dangerous in the US. So you don't do that in the US, except if you want to finish in jails. Um, <laughs> always big lawsuits, because they love lawsuits. Um, so it's also one of the reasons why DLC was developed in, in France is that we don't have software patents. And that's all. LibDBDCSS is in Europe. No, LibDBDCSS is not a patent problem, it's a breaking DRM problem, which is also illegal almost everywhere. But libdbdcss is not breaking your DRM. It's just that the TBD encryption is so weak that you don't need to break it because it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> so is it a DRM if it's not efficient? <laughs> Maybe not. So, but that's why, for example, we can't ship some way to, to play Blu-rays directly from VLC. You need something else because the encryption and the DRAM scheme in Blu-rays is extremely complex and extremely efficient. But DVD is just like... Like first they're starting with a, an encryption algorithm in 56 bits, because that was the limit from the DVD from the US to export. And then they did three major mathematical mistakes, which basically brought the algorithm from 56 bits of entropy to 24 and 24, and then they use the same key for all the discs and all the players everywhere. <laughs> and they almost all start by the same part, so you move from 24 bits to 16 bits, and like brute forcing 
16 bits. And, and then, you know, it's video, so the data is always done in the same way. So <laughs> they have the same headers and the same packets all the time. So like in order to really, I mean, it's not a DRM, it's like, like any of you could write a better DRM than DVDs. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, uh, guys, please <laughs> fill in the uh, feedback form so that we can get. Feedback, yeah, I get feedback. <laughs> yeah. and, and, also, and also, if, if you all are coming, right, please do indicate on the Facebook group like, who's coming because, like, you know, it's very hard to guess how many people are coming and, like, predict how much pizza you're gonna eat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, please do help us. Thanks. And hope that you all have enjoyed this uh, Friday night. I think it's quite special and rare. To have, uh, hard to find guests. <laughs> yeah, like you said, it's probably not going to come back in 10 years, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe Singapore is nice, but it's not pretty good. <laughs> <laughs>